Hello, everyone. My name is Solomay Tibabu, and I'm the host of Going Digital Behavioral Health Tech. I'm really excited for this session with Dr. Histon today. Um, before we get started, perhaps you could give us a brief introduction. Sure. And Salome, first, I want to say thank you for inviting me to be here to present. I've enjoyed as a spectator the last couple of years, so it's an honor to be here. Um, so as you mentioned, I'm Trina Histon. My background is as a health psychologist, and I'm a senior principal consultant at Kaiser Permanente and have been working on building out a digital mental health ecosystem with, with the team I'm part of for the past several years. Excellent. Thanks so much. And so um, what is Kaiser Permanente doing for our audience to better understand sure. the digital mental health front? Sure. So if you're not familiar with us, we're America, one of America's largest and oldest integrated not-for-profit health system. So we are both the payer and the provider of care. And we started, if I think of the why and the how and the where, if I kind of think of it that way, our why back in 2017 was when we looked at our data, we were seeing about 20 25 percent of our members, that's what we call folks who, who are part of our care, um, were seeking care in specialty behavioral health, about 20, 25% of them. And then when we would do an intake with them, they, they were sort of, if you look on a medical continuum, they were subclinical. So we were seeing a lot of needs um, that people were, were feeling like they needed more help in their day to day. And they, uh, yet they were sort of subclinical on the medical side. And we wanted to explore how might we meet needs differently. Um, so, you know, back in 2017, it feels like a long time ago now, um, since we've been all living through this pandemic, um, you know, we were seeing a lot of digital mental health tools and thought that um, they might be able to, uh, you know, add more sort of at your fingertips convenience for in the moment support for folks who are subclinical. So that was sort of our, our why. And, you know, the how we leverage human centered design, which if you're familiar, it's an empathy based problem solving methodology. And what that enables you to do is to really go deep um, with your users. And in this case, there's sort of two sides to it. Um, we have our clinicians think about therapists, think about psychiatrists, uh, primary care clinicians um, and really understanding you know, their workflows and what do they do when somebody is coming in and they're, you know, in their, their crisis that may not be sort of meeting a medical threshold, but they need help and support. So what was their current toolbox, if, if I can put it that way? And so we really learned a lot doing that. And then we also talked to those members and, you know, talked about their care experience and what was going on in their lives that prompted them to reach out. And, you know, clinically, it was sort of a lot of subclinical depression, anxiety, and folks who were sort of moving toward adjustment disorder, they'd had something very disruptive happen in their lives, and they were struggling. So um, leveraging human centered design and designing with those people's situations in mind, we were able to build out our digital mental health ecosystem, which has two layers, one is a clinical layer, um, we have six apps right now, three mindfulness meditation and three cognitive behavioral therapy. And um, a clinician as part of a referral and a plan of care can add that to someone's plan of care when they're um, in care within Kaiser Permanente. And then as we were doing this work, you know, a lot of people don't seek care. Who, who struggle. Um, we wanted to build out what we call a self-care option. So via kp.org, our member website, our members today can access Calm and My Strength, um, one as mindfulness, one cognitive behavioral therapy as part of their care at no cost to them. And, and they can get that without having it necessarily tethered to a visit because we recognized we want to be able to put these tools in multiple places. Um, so, so the where is, you know, self-care and or within within clinical care. But, but what we started out with was about 25 clinicians. And now we've rolled out across all our markets to, you know, over 2,400 clinicians and specialty behavioral health. So um, that's sort of the story so far. And we continue to, to optimize that. But it's been a very uh, rewarding journey. And every day there are new lessons to learn. I think it's fair to say as you build an ecosystem, it's a dynamic living thing. Wow, that's just remarkable. And this is for adults at the moment? Yes, at the moment. Uh, so what I've what I've just spoken to is adults, um, uh, 18 and older. Uh, but my day to day work right now actually is we're expanding the ecosystem um, for youth mental health. So think about ages 13 to 24, very different. So we have the ecosystem and all the different pieces and, you know, codified workflows into EMRs, but youth have different needs. And that age span from 13 to 24, 
very different, a lot of developmental things happening, a lot of milestones that sadly young people are missing because of the pandemic. And and I think we've all like even in in the New York Times over the the weekend uh, uh, an article on youth mental health and youth in crisis. You know we were seeing the the figures go up before the pandemic, and it's just been a straight straight curve up, if you will. So um, we are working to understand their needs deeply, and also similar process of learning from parents, caregivers, youth, and our clinicians and building out that ecosystem right now. So that's a lot of fun and it's very different in terms of how you engage and how you make a referral and, and you know, all, all the fun stuff. So we're we're trying out a lot of different things to see what might, might stick. Hmm. As you alluded to earlier, Kaiser Permanente is a prolific health system. And just by everything that you've just shared, it's clear that you're leading the way with digital interventions for all of your uh, members. And I'd like to just share with our health system audience members, why should health systems consider building a digital portfolio now? Right, right. I think it's a great question. Um, I think back as I reflected on our why, um, it's evolved. I mean, what we saw when we started was we were thinking mild symptomology, subclinical, these tools will be really supportive for those patients. But actually what we've discovered is they're good for everybody. So if somebody has moderate or even severe depression, and again, they're in a comprehensive plan of care, maybe that includes medication, psychiatry, therapy, uh, these tools can be a, a, a sort of a, a way to concretize homework between sessions. And, and a, again, a touchstone if somebody's, um, say, got anxiety and they're feeling life event is prompting that response for them, they know that they've got the tools you know on their phone from their care provider that can help them manage through that moment and then obviously we're there for them too so I think it's fair to say you know as health systems we have been living through a pandemic Uh, my take is we've probably innovated a decade's worth in the two years of the pandemic Uh, we tend to be a risk averse industry and and perhaps maybe slower to innovate as, as an industry. And I think there are good reasons for that because, you know, we're, we're providing healthcare and that's a very vulnerable relationship for, for somebody seeking care to be. And it's not the same as other consumer experiences. At the same time, consumers are expecting a seamless, you know, fit into my life uh, kind of day-to-day experience, whether it's, you know, going shopping or taking transportation and they're expecting that of healthcare as well. So I think the pandemic has brought that even more to the fore. And I think the other thing we've probably all done as health systems is pivot to telehealth. Uh, we, we certainly did very quickly. We had sort of all the apparatus in place and we're just able to turn the dial all the way up to 10, if you will. And, you know, over 95, over 95% of our visits turned into be virtual care very quickly. I want to say even within a month. So I think um, health systems have probably had to innovate quite a bit in the pandemic. So A, there's an expectation. B, there is even more need than there was prior to the pandemic. You know, we saw the literature coming out early from China, from Italy, from countries that had very big waves very, very quickly. You know, stress, insomnia, anxiety, uh, you know, were more, far more prolific um, in populations that that were going through the surges. And I think we've seen the same data come out of the United States. Um, so, so the need is there. It's grown in the pandemic. Um, you've likely, as a health system, innovated in some ways um, over the course of time. And there's an expectation that people will want care, at least a piece of care, to be delivered this way. And they'll want something that's sort of on their time and in their pocket, given the penetration of smartphone um, use in this country. And and I would say to think about building a portfolio or an ecosystem approach, because there is no one app that rules them all, if I can frame it that way, you are going to have to think about your diverse member base and bring tools to bear that support that lived experience. Um, You know, a lot of the early apps were developed in English only. Thankfully, that's changing. A lot more language diversity. And I think, honestly, a lot more diversity in general, because again, um, you know, consumers will vote with their feet or their eyeballs if they're giving attention to your app. And it's table stakes now to to think about diversity, inclusion, equity in your design as as you move through that. So there are all the positive things. And I I think if you don't start doing this work, you will then sort of get left behind, candidly. That's just where the world is moving, Um, not just the US, but I'm seeing it globally. The time is now. 
time is probably yesterday truthfully but but there's there's good places to start and and you're not alone in the journey and um you know we published uh in new england journal medicine catalyst our experience so we have our lessons learned in there Uh, i can pop it in the chat later on and make that uh, link available so you don't you're not starting from a zero body of knowledge You, you actually can leverage um what we've learned sometimes the hard way. Hmm. That's amazing. Yes. I'm excited to share that resource with our audience because sure. as you mentioned, all of the important considerations to keep in mind, everything from, you know, you can't just have one solution for everybody. You've got to have a portfolio of different tools for different populations. Mm-hmm. You've really put those into practice, which is. Yeah. Uh, yes. Right. And they're all different. <laughs> Um, you know, a lot of people ask me, how did you choose the apps that you chose? And I think back in 2017, you know, we're an evidence-based health system. So so the evidence base drives a lot. So this is why we leaned into um, apps that were more mindfulness-based stress reduction and cognitive behavioral therapy, because the evidence base was strongest uh, for those two sort of uh, modalities, if you will. Um, and then, you know, so we looked at the evidence, we looked at the early outcomes company ha- companies had, and they're growing that now. So it's nice to see the evidence arm almost starting um, day zero for a lot of startups now, because, you know, as health systems, we need to see that you're reflecting the evidence base. And then I think um, just as important too is the user experience, because if you've got the best app in the world and nobody uses it because you've developed all the science, but the user experience is just very clunky and not intuitive, people will never use it. Um, so those three areas were super important. We've now evolved that rubric or framework, if I think of it that way, into seven um, seven different areas, 78 items that we leverage. And that goes all the way from the evidence base to you know, your engagement tools to your um, your company composition, your board, um, sort of your reputation, how you are, how you'll be as a partner to work with. Uh, we think about um, sort of different pricing models that are out there. And then very importantly, sort of the IT infrastructure, privacy and safety, of course, in healthcare. Um, you know, there's there's regulations that we follow, but then there's expectations because, you know, first do no harm is is where we come from. And so really evolving that over time. We We don't have expectations that that's all perfect day one. But as we work with you over the years, you'll get to that kind of finish line of having all those pieces in place. So we're learning a lot in that uh, and growing a lot in our thinking too, because the way I see it is, you know, w- we step into a space together, you know, with humility and start to meet unmet need. And I think that's, we're learning together. So it's it's a journey that uh, is, is multi years in the making, candidly. Yeah, thanks for adding that, because I'm sure a lot of startups were wondering, how did you come to your... Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, as well. Hmm. So you mentioned something earlier around um, user experience, and you know it's one thing to have the app available, but if no one's using it, how do you? Let's talk about engagement. But maybe first, mm-hmm. how do you even define engagement? That's a great question. Um, so there's no standard definition in the literature for engagement, um, and I think of it in four dimensions. There's sort of this model out there called the FIT model, and it's you know frequency intensity of use, the time spent in the app, uh, and then the type of content consumed. So they're sort of the four dimensions that I think about. I mean, you can use something frequently, but maybe if you're like me and I'm guilty of this, you see the red notification on an app and that just visually bothers me. So I got to go in, clear it out and empty it and I'm gone. So I, I might be a frequent user, but I wasn't engaging in any deep way. So that's sort of some of the differentiation there that I'll make. So what we've seen um, you know, I think there's been the sense of more use equals better, and I'm not entirely sure that's true um, in terms of our experience. And the other thing I'll say is, you know, we, we like to think of dose response in medicine. It's it's sort of a clear thing to think about. You do this much and this happens. Um, I think of it as in terms of a use response, but I also see there are different ways to, to use it to get value. And I think in our in our deployment thus far, we see distinct um, what I call arcs of engagement. Um, so there's there's a use pattern that's almost a daily pattern. So, um, you know, whether it's meditating every day or, you know, reminding yourself to do a cognitive reframe or, you know, for behavioral activation that you're making a plan to meet friends or, or go for a walk in the park, that you're intentional about engaging in the tools and techniques that work. And so we see some folks every day they're in there, you know, doing doing a tool or or, or doing something every day. That is one arc of engagement. Um, and then there's another that looks more like kind of 
aspirin use, if I can frame it that way. So it's once or twice, and then it drops, and then it comes back to once or twice, and then it drops. So that those individuals are getting value in a time they need it, um, but but no longer than when they need it. So it's almost, and we've heard this from our members, oh, I go there when I'm not feeling good, but they don't think, think about using it every other day. It's only when they need it. And then another distinct use pattern is kind of what I frame as sort of antibiotic use, like five to seven days use, and then a drop. And then they come back for another five to seven days. So I feel like all of those arcs are valid. And, you know, what I'm seeing now in the more sophisticated apps is they're able to show you a path through uh, how content is consumed, if I can frame it that way, or modules are completed is another way to think about it. That relates to reliable change on a GAD7 or a PHQ9. Um, and I think that's, so, so my expectation is I'm looking for that. I'm looking for symptom improvement. If you're leveraging a tool that measures that, whether it's a PHQ-9, a GAD-7, or a perceived stress score, depending on your tool. And I want to see, you know, reliable improvement. And of course, in, in the world of depression, anxiety, response or remission. And I'll be looking to, to see what percentages um, get to those clinical levels. So, so the clinical benchmarks are very important. And then some apps, they're not appropriate for. So, you know, then I'm thinking about the logins and the content consumed. And over time, as we grow, you know, our sophistication with the data, you know, we will be able to look at sort of a total plan of care on, you know, if someone has diabetes and then they also have depression and now they're leveraging these tools, what's happening within their whole plan of care? Uh, because we know the data is clear if, if folks have chronic conditions and then they also have uh, mental health issues. Um, that if you improve the mental health issues, then you see an improvement overall um, in that person's quality of life and, you know, their diabetes improves too. So there, that's the future of where we're going to go with the data. Um, but but that's what we see with engagement. I will reflect that in the published literature, um, we see about 3.9% of people still engage after day 14. That's a tiny, tiny number. And, and we're seeing, you know, four and five X factor of engagement, much longer tails of time in our deployment. And I, I think that's because of how we've done it. It's, it's again, the trusted relationship with your, your therapist or your psychiatrist, your primary care doctor. And then um, when you go back in for another visit, so how's that going? How are you using it? And then there's a conversation about, well, other folks who have what you've going on also find this particular tool set useful. So we're very specific in the referral of where to start, but also where to explore next if, if that's a need within the context of the visit. And I think all of those things contribute to engagement. Um, so that's, I think engagement is, is just critical um, because if you, if you just open the app and download it and you never do anything else, that's not going to work for us in healthcare. Mm -hmm. Right. And I really like this point that you made, like the, the clinical benchmarks. It's like the PHQ-9 scores. That's really just table stakes. You've mm -hmm. offered our audience a lot more things that they could think of above and beyond that. Right, right. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, that's my expectation for for. You know, of course, there's digital tools that are wellness oriented, then all the way up to digital therapeutics. So I have a lot more expectations around digital therapeutics. But I, I feel like, um, you know, the, the value here is it's it's been a way to concretize the work you do, you know, in therapy. And, and it's a way to bring it home with you. And, you know, we've heard from members that, oh, yeah, I talked about that with my therapist. And then it becomes alive in a whole new way. And it's personalized in the app experience because then you're doing the exercises. You're maybe you're typing in some thoughts, feelings, behaviors, if, if it's a CBT app or you're hearing someone leading meditation, speak about something you referenced in therapy or a concept your therapist may have you've spoken to them about. And here it is. And now you're meditating to it. So that's the value of, of being able to do that. Um, and, you know, I do think we need to go beyond the clinical benchmarks to the other value points that digital can bring, because, you know, on paper, you can get to scale and spread and reach far more with a digital tool. And I still think we're ramping up for that, you know, in, in the entire industry of healthcare. And I still think app companies are, are uh, trying to, to solve for that, too. Right. Not completely yes, there, yeah. Not. yeah, exactly. That's, um, and I know, something that we've talked about in the past has been that health systems, other providers that are using these digital tools, there is so much more that startups can evolve with their data to really inform new insights that Absolutely. we haven't even thought of today. You know? Absolutely. I mean, I'm excited for that personally, because I think, you know, in digital in general, whether it's for mental health or otherwise, I think we're data rich, but sort of insight poor. 
And I think um, the, the value and the next frontier is to how do you personalize my data and those insights back to me because, you know, there's a continuous data stream happening. And in healthcare, we might have episodic data happening. So you've got a whole different value proposition from a data perspective. And if we can bring those two together and really deliver new insights about how do we make the experience better? How can we be better as a health system in making that referral even stickier? So more people will say, oh, that's that's going to really fit for me. And they'll download and, and begin to leverage the tools and then come back in and you know work with their therapist on that. So I'm excited for that. That's the next frontier, I think. Yeah, you just started to allude to a couple ideas for mm-hmm. at least for the health systems who are just getting started in the audience. Maybe they're just starting to integrate some digital tools. How can they really get that engagement kickstarted? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yeah. So um, as, as I mentioned earlier, we did leverage human centered design. So if I think about the evidence base, um, what we'd seen from the literature implementation science and digital mental health was there were a couple of barriers. One was confidence and another belief that can these tools help? Um, I don't know what they're about. Do I have time to go check them out? Um, and then the other big piece is how do I fit this in my workflow? I, I don't, you know, I've got, you know, depending on the care setting, I might have 50 minutes or I might have 30 minutes or I might have 20 minutes or, you know, depending on, on you know, which kind of clinician I am. And so we really wanted to understand their current state with digital tools and then see what's going to be valuable for them. So, you know, I think design it with, with your end users in mind and really, you know, shadow them like we shadowed phone calls we shadowed visits we really saw you know where are they clicking in the emr we wanted to build because the app is one piece here uh you can have a great app but if it's again if you haven't fit it into the workflows it's never going to get referred and so we really spent a lot of time thinking about how a clinician spending their time and you know wanting to make it really really easy to make the referral patterning to the workflows they have and the tools they already go through when they're clicking to, through the EMR um so so that was a big piece of it and in doing that um and and we were lucky enough that we were able to kind of roll one out one at a time so we were able to go really deep and and therapists like oh yeah I really like this one because it's got all of this or it has acceptance commitment therapy and intellectual behavioral therapy as well as cognitive behavioral therapy so this is mine for members who have this going on and then the other therapists go, oh, wow, that's great. I didn't know that about that. And so all this cross learning. So we codified all of the all of the learnings into what we call an app map referral. And so for different, you know, if I'm having grief issues or sleep issues or stress or, you know, relationship issues, it's very clear which app is strongest for those areas. And so when you're busy as a clinician, you can go to that app map recommendation guide and then go, okay, this person's got a lot of grief going on, which many people do in the pandemic, then um, this is the one I'm going to refer the patient to first. So you're making that match right the first time and really personalizing why you think that's a good solution. So we've codified all of that into training materials. We've built on-demand training because really I think of it as a digital mental health competency. And so we really wanted to listen to our clinicians who've been with us for many years now in this journey about what's compelling for them and pull that through the training. Um, so then we ramped up in 2020 because we really we really turned the dial up on training folks. We were able to do that. So, so think about all those pieces, like what's the context of the deployment? Um, how are folks using the EMR, different care settings? Specialty will use it different to primary. Um, we have health coaches as well that also refer. And so they will do, they'll have a different instance. They'll see a different patient population. How are you making sure it's easy for them to do that? And, and then continuing to bring to life what's in the app because the apps are always changing. And so you want to keep refreshing. Okay, now it has a module on, you know, uh, postpartum depression, for example, or a, a module on grief. And so we want to make sure that content flow is always coming through. So we have champions groups that meet regularly and share best practices and uh, tips and tricks. And then again, we're always codifying and then deploying. So it's not enough to just put it out there and then walk away. It's a continuous cycle of learning. And, and that's to me what the ecosystem is. It's permeable in its what it does and it's permeable in its learnings that you're always bringing those through. So they're the things that I think about and we're still taking care of every day. Wow. So this is what you mean by integration. I mean, that the not yes. probably an investment on the, the staff and training component, mm-hmm. but mm-hmm. Um, <clears throat> between apps. And maybe I'll ask you, what's the expectation for integration with an EMR? That's a great question. So we, we've we thought about that and we're, we're sort of on our data infrastructure next, uh, next gen journey um, uh, because, you know, we wanted to start small and, and innovate and then keep iterating on what was working. So um, 
uh, as yet we haven't so let me let me frame this so emr data as you know is what we consider category one data um and so it never goes away it's in the emr it kind of stays there uh, mm -hmm. app data is often considered like category three data or category four data mm -hmm. and the quality of it can be quite variable being candid and so when we're thinking about what data might we want to bring in from an app um we have to really think about well what's the quality of it Where's the integrity in it? And is it is it worth bringing all the way in to, to our EMR? And I think they're sort of questions we're asking ourselves as the space matures, um, especially around things like PHQ9, app drive PHQ9 versus clinic drive PHQ9. So I think that's that's kind of the easiest journey. Um, so, so right now with our data infrastructure, we're sort of creating a space where um, it's almost like a data lake where we have our EMR data, we have the app data, and then we're able to run reports. So we're able to look at referrals, we're able to look at engagement, we're able to look at how long someone stays in that arc of engagement I spoke about. And then we're able to feedback those learnings to, to our clinicians and say, you know, here's the percentage of patients referred to app A, B, C, D, E, or F. And, and, you know, the why around that and be able to talk about that. So that's where we're at. I imagine other systems are thinking about the full bringing all that data in, ingesting it. Maybe they've got a care management team that's looking at data. That's certainly another way to do it. It's not sort of how we've uh, decided to do it um, yet. Um, but we are, um, as you can imagine, different apps, whether they began life as a direct consumer and then they decided to be uh, B2B, they're on a journey um, with their own sophistication of reporting and capabilities. And so I found that... Um, Harmonizing that is a journey, and, and that's the one we're on right now is to harmonize the data coming in so we can look at all the CBT apps. And we've been doing that with pre-post PHQ9s. We can look at all the mindless meditation apps and see, you know, what, what are the patterns of use between both that are comparable. And, um, and I think, you know, some companies have the capability of coming right into the EMR and things can sit on top of it and you can see scores going up and down and act and then others are not there yet. So I think if you're starting with that, uh, that's a longer journey and you, you'll have a lot more dev work to do. But if you, if you start with seeing what the signal will be with, with your clinicians and with, with your patients and members, I think that's a good place to start. Uh, I think we've learned a lot from that to make it scalable. So it holds when you, when you flow it out to, you know, 12.5 million people. Mm -hmm. Right, that's member really good advice for both startups and health systems getting started um, at the pilot stage. Perhaps you don't have to go full in EMR integration just yet. But right, right. Toward that. Right. Yeah. Understand the expectations. So your your blueprint or roadmap has that in in place, um, but it's going to be hard to do everything day one. It's it, you know, and and we recognize that that app companies are just not going to get every single thing, but the expectation is you will get there if if you want to get to scale and spread. You you have to. Um, to be able to do all those things. Really good advice. And now I've got one more question. What are some lessons learned from a health system on how to be a good partner to startups if they want to pursue this path? That's a great question. I think, uh, think about the role you want to play. Um, so do you want to start with companies that are well-established? They're, they're down the line with their series funding. They have a robust product. They've worked with other health systems. That might be one place to start. And and candidly, that might be where most health systems like to start. But I've also seen, you know, systems be um, kind of in an accelerator mode. So they're taking a product they really like. Maybe not all the pieces are in play, but the potential is is there. And then together, you know, with, with mentorship and relationship building, you kind of are able to mold the product to what, you, what will meet your, your base. So think about if that's the role you'd like to play. And then I see others still... Um, more being more like incubators. So they recognize there's a big clinical need. Um, maybe the space is very nascent. And I think that's pretty fair of the youth mental health space that it's quite nascent. And you might be in an incubator role. Maybe you're reluctantly an incubator, but you're really helping think about your own needs. They're getting clearer to you as you're looking at your data. And then, you know, working with app companies, um, they're able to bring you, uh, you know, a new suite of, of, of way of thinking. I think, you know, again, I, t I used the humility word earlier, and I think it's important because, you know, we in healthcare, obviously we're looking at a clinical frame. Uh, we're thinking about things in a clinical way. And then app companies are really thinking about the user experience and unmet need and how do you engage people and what are their needs. And so it really can be a very synergistic uh, symbiotic relationship uh, again, with the humility factor where you're both learning and no no one group has all the answers, uh, but you've got a lot of needs. So 
So you're an incubator, you're an accelerator, or you're partnering with a company um, that's mature. Um, I think time frame wise, you know, my experience has been if a company wants to go directly to maybe an employer group, that's maybe a one to two year relationship building journey from starting conversations to deployment. If you're going to a health system, um, my experience, again, it's a one to three year journey from, you know, beginning up, ramping up and scaling and then optimizing. And then if you're going directly to, to provider groups, that's a three to five year journey. So think about, you know, on the health system side, recognize it's it's not going to be turnkey. You're going to do some work to, to make sure it fits and meets your needs. And then if you're a provider system, it's probably a longer journey um, in, in regards to that. So they're, they're the timeframes I've experienced in my history of deploying um, to these kinds of tools, which is over a decade now. So, you know, patience and, you know, really being curious, bringing that curiosity, but always keeping the sort of the user at the center, I think is so, so important. And whether that be a patient or if, if you're a company, whether that's your user base and, and what their needs are, and they are going to evolve and evolve with those in ways that make sense and be data driven. I think they're all the things that I think about. Amazing. Thank you so much, Dr. Histon. I always You're enjoy very your conversations. Um, this was just great advice for both the health systems and startups and vendors in the audience. And I'm excited to see how Kaiser Permanente evolves your digital mental health portfolio. Me too. Me too. But, Thanks for having me and, and uh, best of luck with the conference. I'm looking forward to hearing from other speakers. Thanks for inviting me. Of course. Thanks so much. Take care. Thanks, Salome.